On behalf of all of us at Greif, welcome to the Discover Greif webinar series. My name is Cheryl Cottle, and I'm responsible for marketing and communications for our global industrial packaging division. It's been almost one year since we launched this webinar series. Our first event was with a leadership group like this, providing you with an update regarding our COVID-19 situation. Since then, we've hosted approximately 20 webinars in different languages and we had about 1,500 attendees from all around the world join us. So we want to thank you very much for your engagement and your participation. As we mentioned in the invitation, we've all had to adapt and evolve this past year on how we engage with our customers. And at Grife, we're continuing to innovate our business to optimize how we deliver against our customers, your needs. Today, I'm pleased to have joining with me the leadership team of our newly formed Global Industrial Packaging Business Unit. Heading this division is Ole Rosgard, and I'll let him introduce his team later on during this event. Not everyone will be presenting today, but all are in attendance should you have any questions. In addition, two other popular presenters are joining them, Luca Batoni, our Global Product Manager, and Aisu Katoon, our Director of Sustainability. We will be recording this event to share with those who are unable to attend and we'll send out this, the links later on via email. Your account managers will also have access to the PowerPoint decks should you be interested in those. You'll find a chat button in the center of your screen where you can submit questions at any time during the presentation. And please feel free to do so when that question pops into your head and we'll entertain those all at the end of the event. At this time, I'll pass the floor to Oli. He'll get us started. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I'm Oli Rosgaard, Group President for our Global Industrial Packaging. Um, I would like to start with a, a big thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate that and we value your business. Um, our ultimate focus, and if you could advance the slide, Cheryl, uh, our ultimate focus is to become the best customer service company in the world. And I would like to spend a minute taking you through some of the actions that we are taking to achieve that. Uh, last year, we conducted a, a VOC or a voice of the customer survey as we call it, uh, where we uh, used a consultant PWC to, to do it very objectively, uh, to interview more than 600 of our customers. Uh, and then we uh, analyzed all that data and, and created the pyramid you see here. And what our customers told us was that they have foundational needs or, or what we call table stakes. Um, and we, of course, have significant focus on all these foundational elements. I will in a minute uh, cover two of them uh, and then share some of our specific actions with you. The strategic uh, elements are what you as our customers told us that are really important to you. Um, and those are primarily innovation and sustainability. And often those two are also uh, linked together. And we will cover that a little bit later also during this webinar. Two of the tools we use to improving our customer service are NPS or Net Promoter Score and CSI, which in, in, it's an internal terminology. Uh, it means Customer Service Index. Uh, most of you know that as OTIF, uh, on-time delivery, uh, on time delivery in full. Uh, but we have other elements that we have added to the OTIF calculation, such as credit note or um, or a faulted product. So if we deliver a whole truckload of products to, to you uh, and one product is faulty, it counts the whole consignment uh, as uh, not delivered in full. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to achieve a high score on this one. And nevertheless, because we focus on this every single month, we have now uh, slowly but securely managed to to drive our uh, CSI score to uh, above 95, uh, which is, is very high. And we do that by focusing on this every single month by plant. So if you imagine we have 157 plants around the, the, the world uh, in uh, global industrial packaging, every single plant get measured on that. 
the plant measure gets rolled up into the regional measure, measure and then ultimately that gets rolled up uh, into the, um, the corporate measure. And we also share this monthly measure with the board. Um, on the NPS score, that's the score we, we do once a year now. We go out and we ask our customers, you, uh, what you, um, for your feedback. And, and what we do with that feedback is that uh, we, we work very seriously with it. If you have given us a comment, uh, we read those comments. I read all of them. We discuss them internally. We go back to that particular customer and we seek uh, clarification or more information. Um, and then we go back home and we work on that and we come up with preventive actions of how we can avoid uh, this issue to, to, to occurring again. And then we go back to our customer explaining uh, what we have done. And we are driving this relentlessly. And as you can see here, we are now uh, way above best in class. And as a result of that, you know, we're really competing with ourselves. Another last, large uh, change we did last year was to merge our three distinct product divisions into one global operation. Uh, in the past, uh, you will have known us uh, as our rigid business, our flexible business, and also as our accessory business. We have now merged that, so all that is within the same business unit, and that's what we call global industrial packaging. Now, we did this to be able to service you uh, better and to become more consistent across the globe uh, with everything we do. And when I say uh, consistent, I mean consistency in quality, consistency in the way we train people, in the, the tools we use, and consistency in the, the processes uh, we, we employ. Uh, so that you will have the same experience, whether it's your business in China or your business in um, Brazil, for, for example. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our uh, global team. Uh, this team, uh, this team is leading uh, the more than 11,000 uh, people uh, across 41 countries that is involved in, in global industrial packaging. As a team, we really go out of our way to meet and be involved with our customers. And it's not just in sales, but also operations, safety, and supply chain. And although we are the largest uh, industrial packaging company in the world, um, we as a team involve ourselves with you. And we work very hard to be experienced as a small family company. And in a small family company, when a customer have a need or uh, a challenge, then you know, a small family owner will respond to the customer day and night. And we work hard to, in, to be experienced by you in, in the very same way. I would like to start with uh, introducing Sylvia. Sylvia has recently uh, assumed the responsibility for, <clears throat> excuse me, our America's sales team. Um, and for the Americas, we also have Gaylords. So Sylvia and Gaylords are, are responsible for the Americas. Then equally in EMEA, uh, we have Paddy, uh, who is responsible for our operations in EMEA. Yeah. And we have Roy, who's responsible for our sales in EMEA. Then you have Chris Loeffler, who is responsible for our finance. Uh, we have uh, Kim Kellerman. Kim is responsible for our operations, our engineering, uh, and our safety uh, around the globe. We have Brian, who's responsible for HR. And then we have Hari Kumar. Hari is responsible for uh, all our flexible business and also for all our other businesses in APAC. We have Graham Durden, who serves as operational support. At the moment, he's deeply involved in uh, supply chain. And then uh, least, uh, but not uh, last, but not least, we have uh, Philippe Marti, who runs our uh, commercial excellence um, uh, part of the organization. Who you do not see here, who's with us today, is Aisu Katoon, who leads our uh, global sustainability efforts. And we also uh, have Lu Luca Petoni, who will talk to you about uh, innovation. Um, with that, I will now hand you over to Philippe.
Thank you, Ole. Yeah, so I'm Philippe Marty. I'm the head of commercial excellence. Um, so as Ole showed you uh, up front in the, what we got from you and uh, in the VOC, uh, two foundational elements uh, which are coming on top of quality, price, and on-time delivery is our ability to answer faster, so to be more, uh, let's say, faster in issue resolution, and also to improve our communication. Uh, so we have taken some initiatives. So with what has happened with the COVID, we have adapted, of course, to, uh, let's say, uh, the um, situation. We have developed webinars, as it was said by, uh, by Cheryl, we developed already about 20 webinars. They are available on demand to your account manager or also uh, on the website. We will continue this effort uh, and we have planned to get one webinar per, uh, per month. Um, also, some of you have enjoyed uh, plan tours, virtual plan tours uh, to know some of our operations. Uh, this is also something we have launched internally uh, to all our employees. We do two plan tours a week. Um, so what is important, I think, for you to know is that if you want to visit one of our plants in the current circumstances, this is absolutely possible at any time. So you just need to ask your account manager, let's say, to, uh, to organize this, and we will be pleased to, uh, to answer this. Beside this, we are also developing a web-based plan tour uh, that will be available for all the, all the products. Um, Another uh, element of uh, this uh, feedback we got from you is, as I said, focusing on faster response and issue resolution. So uh, we have, uh, let's say, a global project to, to lead this part of customer service, where we are looking and reviewing the roles and responsibilities in the organization uh, of the, all the customer uh, service facing people. We are reviewing and changing our complaint and sampling process. We have developed a pricing tool for the Salesforce so that they can come back to you faster on pricing. Uh, we are also uh, working on order, order entry automation as well as data sheet automation. For the future, we are looking at customer portal and e-commerce to better serve you. Um, and so this is something that you're going to hear in the coming uh, month from us. One of the things that uh, we would like also to understand from you, we'll get a a, a, a quick poll is how you, you see the future in terms of interaction. In, in many countries, we went in terms of sales interaction, sales meeting to 100% virtual. We would be happy to understand what is your view, assuming that uh, soon we will be back to a, a new normal and we can meet again. Uh, so we will appreciate to get your, your feedback uh, on this. So this being said, I pass the floor to ISU. Sustainability was also something absolutely critical that you mentioned. And so I soon will tell you about our initiatives on sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. My name is Aisu Katun and I'm the director of sustainability at Greif. I'll be providing some highlights from our sustainability program. Next slide, please. We have one of the most comprehensive sustainability programs in our industry and our focus areas that you see on the slide are prioritized by current and emerging broader external sustainability issues and trends and their significance to our business and our stakeholders, including our customers, the environment and society at large. The topics that you see here were determined through a materiality assessment that we conducted with a third party. We recognize our global responsibility and so we focus our efforts on areas where we can drive sustainability along our value chain together with our customers. Next, I would like to provide some updates on some of our achievements from 2020. Minimizing the waste from our operations and providing life cycle services for our products are key components of our circular strategy which is why one of the environmental goals that we have is our waste goal, which is to divert 90% of, of the waste from our operations from going to landfills. We're currently diverting 71% of our waste from landfills through our recycling and reuse efforts. And we have 39 zero waste to landfill facilities globally, which means that they're only sending less than 0.5% of their waste to landfills. We also have a network of facilities that provide life cycle services in the US and EMEA that can provide collection, recycling and reconditioning services for steel, plastic and paper products. And you can see on the slide the number of products we have recycled and reconditioned in 2020. Our social targets and performance focus on the development and well-being of our workforce 
and we're making good progress towards our 2025 targets, which you can find on our website or on our sustainability report. Our efforts as a leader in sustainability are being recognized and verified by third parties such as CDP and Ecovitis, which we believe is an important signal of our commitment to sustainability, just like our customers. And on the right hand side, you can see some of the scores that we have received over uh, the last couple of years. The scores that you see here are from 2020. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, one of our key priorities is to help our customers reach their own sustainability targets and work together to help address some of the most pressing environmental issues such as climate change. This is why we created the Grife Green Tool, which is an online tool that calculates the carbon footprint of our products based on independent life cycle data. The tool was developed by a research institution in Germany and is based on ISO standards. And with this tool, we can calculate the environmental footprint of a single product or a range of products, or we can compare the environmental footprint of different graph products, processes, or transportation options to help our customers make informed decisions um, on the best uh, products that they can get from Grife with the least environmental impact. Next slide, please. Uh, when we conducted our life cycle analysis of our products, we found that the majority of our products environmental footprint is associated with the raw materials that we use and also what happens to our products at the end of their lives. These findings shaped our strategy on how we can create low carbon products and also how we can help create a circular economy. This strategy is focused on providing solutions to our customers to help them reduce the environmental impact from the packaging products that they're getting from Rife. So the first part of the strategy focuses on down gauging or reducing the raw materials that we use in, our, in, in the production of our products or finding alternative raw materials. So on the left hand side, you can see the variety of products that we offer that are down gauged, including plastic drums, jerry cans, IBCs, smaller plastic products and steel drums. The second part of the strategy focuses on using recycled plastic resins or PCR in the production of our plastic products. Depending on the amount of PCR that we use, our customers can reduce the carbon footprint from the packaging products that they're getting from Grife anywhere from 30 to 55%. In the middle, you can see some of the PCR products that we offer, and I would like to highlight that our PCR IBCs have the highest amount of PCR in the market currently. And this is a portfolio of products that we're constantly working on expanding. The third part of our strategy focuses on providing collection, recycling, and reconditioning services for our used plastic and steel products, which can help reduce our customers' carbon footprint from the packaging products that they're getting from Grife by up to 75%, and also create a circular system where waste is minimized and sometimes even eliminated. So these are the solutions uh, that are designed to reduce both our own and our customers' environmental footprint and minimize the natural resources used and waste created. Next slide, please. As I hope you can see, uh, we take sustainability very seriously, both in our own operations and within the value chain that we operate. Ultimately, our goal is to help our customers and suppliers become more sustainable and reach their own sustainability targets so that we can collectively tackle the larger issues that we face as a society. And we're looking forward to collaborating with you on this journey. With that, I will pass it over to you, Luca, to provide updates on product innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aizu. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Luca Bettoni, and I'm honored today to represent uh, the global product management uh, uh, team uh, within uh, GIP. So, uh, yeah. We have seen uh, also in the previous slides how it's important now in our strategy based on the voice of the customer innovation and uh, I would like really to, to show you today just a few slides in uh, some examples but uh, most important really the, uh, the process that we have in place really to manage our innovations and basically we have really a solid structure now in place at global scale and also representing all the business uh, units within uh, GIP. It basically is a combination of uh, different uh, people within the organization representing what is called the Innovation uh, Steering Committee. And uh, everything starts really from, uh, from the customer. So our account managers are really entitled to generate innovation and really with uh, a mindset of uh, uh, 
uh, innovation uh, uh, push, they are really uh, willing to discuss together with you any innovation. Any innovation in the, is coming within Grife, and then with a group of people that I will present in the next slide, uh, we are elaborating all those innovations, and then we are evaluating through the priorities, uh, and then uh, selecting uh, one by one, and then deciding the one that uh, must be follow up uh, and moved uh, ahead. Just to give you an example, in the last uh, 24 months, uh, really we have entered more than 75 innovation in our pipeline. And then uh, through a deep selection and analysis about the timing, the feasibility and uh, the global uh, uh, potential implementation, we have uh, selected and moved ahead uh, around and already implemented uh, uh, tens of those uh, in the market and, and others are uh, still in the pipeline and uh, some others has been uh, freezed or temporarily stopped uh, for any, any reason. So the group is really representing uh, uh, different functions within uh, the company. As I said, everything starts from you, from the customers and then uh, enter into the uh, Grife organization. And then uh, with the regional lead and then uh, with the combination of uh, the analysis of uh, all product managers in all substrate, uh, with the lead of our innovation director, our Scott Schiff, and then uh, all the, uh, the operation excellent, COMEX, uh, finance, uh, and uh, the rest of the organization, as we said, that we are analyzing and then providing back to you. So everything starts through you and finish uh, to you uh, in terms of uh, innovation. So that's uh, really in few words of what we are working. And the very important is that now we are working really together as uh, a global And substrates. If you move to the next slide, yeah, here we are starting from our largest e drums, and it is speaking about the drum 360. So basically, a digital printed uh, sheets uh, that are then used uh, for producing uh, our steel drums. And this is valid also in uh, intermediate and uh, small drums that we are producing uh, uh, in different uh, locations all around the globe. What are the benefits for this uh, uh, type of innovation is really to value the product that you are feeling in your uh, drum, because in this case, uh, for uh, any specific reasons for launching new products or, or uh, uh, specific uh, branding uh, needs that you can have uh, uh, on your product, uh, the drums can be used really for value your uh, product in this case. So this is really valid uh, at the global scale and then also growing uh, day by day, entering uh, uh, more sites uh, every, every month uh, in our organization. So uh, there are no needs for uh, minimum orders. We can produce uh, really just a few drums uh, like uh, we can do really uh, hundreds of uh, thousands, but in this case, really, we are very, very flexible. This uh, Jerrycan reinforced solution is uh, an innovation that uh, you have also seen uh, in the slides of ISO in uh, two uh, parts of uh, the innovation because uh, this is representing together the uh, reduction of weight, uh, keeping the performances, because in this case, uh, this uh, Jerrycan has been studied for uh, reducing the overall weight, uh, keeping the performances of a traditional heavy Jerrycans. Uh, most important is uh, also coming from the voice of the customer to have really a global design within Grife. Uh, by the way, JCR is now valid and uh, already produced in different countries such as uh, Israel, Singapore, uh, Scandinavia, uh, Italy, and uh, under implementation in other, in other, in other regions. And then very important is uh, can be also produced uh, with with uh, uh, post-consumer raising. So in this case, uh, there is also the combination of uh, a lighter weight uh, and also the uh, opportunity to use uh, uh, recycled polyethylene and entering in our eco-balance uh, line of uh, uh, product. So that's uh, really around the plastics innovation. Uh, in uh, our flexible division, uh, I'm really glad to present uh, uh, our MAP card. So first of all, what does it stand for MAP? MAP is uh, Modified Atmosphere Packaging. And this is a system that uh, we as Drive, uh, we have developed uh, as first uh, for uh, um, the, the food, uh, the, the baby food industry and uh, also for the pharma industry, but is now entering more and more in other industries uh, such as uh, dry food uh, or seeds or pigments uh, and some specific chemicals uh, where you need to keep uh, the product uh, in a controlled atmosphere. So basically there is a vacuum out of oxygen and then uh, the entering of uh, specific gases, which are helping you really to extend the, mainly the shelf life of uh, your product, uh, and then many, many other uh, details and the benefits uh, that you can uh, get out uh, from our uh, map guard. So really 
I can stay here really quite long for discussing it, but uh, we are really happy to support you in any future uh, needs or any future uh, information that you will need in this uh, or any other specific uh, topic. Moving ahead in order to uh, enter also in our closure division, this is really one of the latest uh, development that, that we had. So I'm also representing within the, the product management uh, the IBC part uh, and uh, we as a product manager of IBC, I was missing a, a lead like this. Uh, this lead has been developed by our treasure division for having the opportunity of uh, emptying an IBC basically without opening the lead. And uh, this is uh, really very, very important for many closed loop application on, uh, on IBC. So you can imagine how uh, important can be if uh, you are delivering to your customer an IBC, the customer is emptying the IBC without opening the lead, you can collect uh, those IBCs and then you can reuse it again. And then this is really helping you to have a better management of your closed loop uh, uh, situation. And it's also helping for uh, reducing the time for renting uh, uh, of uh, the IBC, which is uh, always, uh, we are running uh, fast in our daily exercise and also the time dedicated for empty IBC can be also an important uh, uh, one. So that's uh, in regards to closures and then to finalize uh, this uh, innovation part, uh, uh, we'd like to present uh, a combination of uh, development uh, of our so-called uh, RIPS organization and flexible organization. Now in GFP, we have been able to uh, develop uh, this uh, GQ flex, uh, where you can see the external structure as uh, the traditional G cube uh, uh, IBC that uh, we are producing uh, globally, mainly with the blow molded bottle on it. But in this case, uh, instead of the blow molded bottle, we can have uh, inside a big bag and then inside the bag also an aseptic liner which is mainly used for very high value product uh, such as uh, fruit concentrate, uh, uh, tomato paste. And now we, are also, uh, we have also developed uh, a specific version for solid uh, products. So the big advantage of GQ Flex uh, is uh, a ready to use uh, packaging. You need just to receive the packaging, connect it to your filling line, fill it, close it and ship it. And then uh, it also enters uh, in our collection network and then can be collected basically all around the globe, uh, everywhere you will need uh, to eat. You can combine this uh, also with uh, the lease model of our IBCs that uh, we have also uh, developed uh, and is also valid for our standard uh, GQ IBC. So as I said, I can stay real, uh, really here for hours uh, describing our product, but uh, just a brief introduction and then uh, you can reach out to uh, your account managers, uh, product managers and myself uh, at any time for further details. I will hand over now to Ole uh, for the uh, execution strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, what I will sort of briefly cover with you now is we, of course, have a, a fairly comprehensive strategy, uh, but just to give you uh, a, a little insight into some of the more specific areas of our strategy. Um, as a company, we spent hundreds of millions a year uh, in CapEx spending. Um, in GIP, uh, in terms of growth, uh, a lot of that is uh, spent in what you see in the top uh, of the slide here. Uh, we are expanding significantly, significantly uh, on IBC. Uh, we are adding capacity all the time. We're building new plants across the globe. Um, and, and that's an area we will continue to expand in. We're also expanding our uh, collection and reconditioning uh, capabilities uh, on IBC. On plastic uh, in general, we are more or less doing the same. Uh, at the moment, we are working on two specific uh, plants that we are establishing for a specific customer. Uh, but with everything we do, we, we do follow uh, our customers and on request, uh, we set up uh, dedicated facilities uh, wherever our customers need it. And specifically that has taken place recently on, on plastic. On FIBC, we uh, have recently approved the uh, building of a new uh, recycling plant. Uh, and what we will be doing there is that we will collect uh, used uh, FIBC bags. Uh, we will then recycle, uh, granulate, clean, and reuse uh, the uh, proper, proper polypropylene uh, into new uh, big bags. Below the orange line here, you have our, uh, um, our steel and our fiber and accessory. Uh, what we're doing here is, is more uh, innovation and it's upgrading our uh, technology. 
Uh, Luca showed you what we're doing on innovation on steel, for instance, in terms of um, the uh, digital printing. Uh, you saw what we're doing on accessories with, with caps, and we do many, many other things as well. But also on fiber, we are, we are doing uh, quite a, a lot of innovation. Um, we are number one in the world in, in these categories. So our focus is really on automation and is, is getting the existing products uh, even better. Uh, and it's uh, introducing <clears throat> new technologies. And with that, um, I will now hand you over to Gaylord, our uh, VPGM of the Americas for a regional update. Yeah, so thanks, Oli. Uh, as Oli mentioned, my name is Gaylord Benner and I am the, the Vice President and General Manager for the Americas. And, and really to take the, just the next couple of minutes and expand on what Oli talked about as our high level global strategy and how that plays into the Americas key initiatives. So if I start looking at this slide, you know, first off, about a year ago, we did form a joint venture with Centurion, and Centurion is now our partner on the reconditioning and rebottling of IBCs. So when we formed that, that uh, joint venture the, a year ago, we really had a, a smaller footprint, and over the last 12 months, we really started to expand that footprint to really be able to encompass the Midwest, the Gulf Coast, as, as well as the Southeast. You know, and that expansion will continue going forward into the near future. If I move over a little bit and talk about plastics as one of our another, another key growth area for us, really the, the things we've been doing in the recent past have been focusing on automation and capacity expansion in the Midwest and the Southeast. Primarily, we have installed a couple of brand new state-of-the-art blow motors uh, with some high-tech automation in both Bradley, Illinois, as well as Livonia, Georgia. We're increasing our jerry can capabilities down in Latin America. And we have recently just completed a project to expand our plastic capability in Northern California, uh, where we really have uh, doubled the capacity of our plastic drum operations out in California. If I move over into the IBC network expansion, we have two key projects uh, that are currently active. One is installing additional capacity down in Houston, Texas. That additional capacity will double our capacity down in the Gulf Coast, and that should be up and running by the end of Q3, early Q4 of this year. The second piece related to that is, you know, when I talked about our, our reconditioning footprint on how currently we're in the Midwest, the Gulf Coast, and the Southeast, we are in the process right now of installing bottle capability into the Northeast, into Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and what that will allow us to do is to expand our reconditioning footprint with our uh, joint venture partner, Centurion. Luca talked a lot about innovation. One thing that we are working on right now, uh, we've done it more in Europe that it'll be coming to the US, we'll be really developing a PCR solution for IBCs. On the steel, as Oli talked about, you know, it's not as much of a growth area for us, but it's more of the automation and, and improving our current existing operations. Luca talked about the developing the 360 project we are installing a brand new seaming complex to put the top and the bottoms on the drums down in Houston. We're installing lining capabilities in Auburndale, Florida, as well as investing in some additional knockdown capabilities down in Latin America. And then on the fiber side, uh, we, we have executed a project where we have increased our capacity in fiber in California. Uh, and we've also uh, added, added an additional new line in there to improve the automation across the board. And one of the questions that came up in the chats uh, here a little while ago is what are we doing uh, on the fiber drum recycling solution? We currently do have an active project for the end of life of fiber drums that we're working through. We currently can recycle fiber drums. We need to expand that and make that more robust across the US. So that is an active project that we're working through as part of our key strategic initiatives. And then Luca already talked about the accessories. So I won't go back into that. And with that, I will turn it over to Patty uh, to discuss the EMEA key strategic initiatives. Uh, thank you, Gaylord. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Paddy Maleni. I'm the VP GM for EMEA. Um, brief update on EMEA. We've had a very active uh, 12 months across the region. Uh, some of the highlights as they relate to your businesses, um, I've tried to summarize here. So uh, we have been active on uh, in doing acquisitions and uh, uh, establishing JVs with some critical partners across the network. Uh, 
Uh, in Italy, uh, we've established a JV with the company LAF. Uh, and uh, in the UK, <coughs> we've established a JV with the Delta Container Group in uh, the northwest of the UK. We've done an acquisition in Germany uh, on, uh, on uh, again, on Rebo IBC. So that is consistent with the strategy as, as referenced by Oli earlier. And we will continue to do that. And uh, uh, we, we have a, a pipeline which we are looking to develop uh, as we move forward. In terms of investments, uh, and again, consistent with our overall strategy, we've uh, put some uh, new capabilities into the UK uh, that was aligned also with the establishment of the JV with Delta. Uh, we have a new blow molder uh, in the process of uh, coming on stream in, in Germany, uh, and that will be uh, live from later on in, in quarter two. Uh, we've also, uh, in the pro we're also in the process of uh, installing a new neutralization unit uh, related to our reconditioning services in Germany. And then on the plastic side, we have two new lines currently coming on stream. They are active at the moment. Um, a large plastic drum line in Durban in South Africa and a jerry can line in uh, Johannesburg in also in South Africa. Um, moving to the right, we, uh, as Gaylord mentioned and referenced uh, by Luca earlier in the innovation section, uh, we have a center of excellence for our digital drum production in Belgium. That's the digital printing unit, but also the uh, pre-printing pre and post-printing uh, capabilities that go along with that, including coding. And that really complements our LITO capabilities, um, and, but it offers a lot more marketing and promotion capabilities. And as Luca mentioned, it uh, can uh, handle demand for very small batch sizes. We have as you would expect, a pipeline of investments across the network, and we uh, see further expansion in Italy and in Russia on jerry can production. Uh, we have further IBC capacity planned for the UK. Uh, we have a new uh, steel drum line uh, in the pipeline for Italy, and then that's on top of other organic investments across the network. The countries referenced here are just a small selection of what we have uh, ongoing across the across the business. That's a brief update on from the EMEA section. So what I will do is hand you over to Harry Harry Kumar, take you through APAC and FPS. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ferry. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining the uh, customer webinar. Um, let me start off with uh, uh, a similar strategic uh, initiative uh, outline of what we're doing in the flexibles business, which is a big bag business, and also in the Asia region. Uh, let me start with the FPS, the flexible business. We recently commissioned uh, in Turkey, which is our largest uh, manufacturing facility, a state-of-the-art nine-layer co-extrusion line uh, of polyethylene films. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art investment. It allows us to uh, make uh, very high-end specialty difficult liners. And I believe that uh, uh, this will be an industry-leading offering in terms of specialty liners for our customers. Uh, Oli talked about uh, a recycling facility that we're building in Romania. Uh, we've tested how to do this before we launched this, uh, this investment. And we're very excited uh, to bring this offering to our customers. And uh, so are many of our customers, and we're already trialing with several customers uh, on this recycling capability. Uh, Luca talked about MapGuard, which is modified atmosphere packaging. That's something that we're already in the market. And we also have SealGuard, which is a, uh, a, a automized bag that is, uh, you know, that has very little stitching. So that's, a, we believe it's a game-changing uh, innovation. And uh, that's, those are some examples of innovation uh, work we're doing in the Flexos business. Uh, across the other substrates, especially in the Asia region, on plastics, we're focusing primarily on small plastics. Uh, we added a blow molder in Singapore recently, uh, and we're focusing on jerry can production. And you can see that uh, there's some consistency across all the other regions, uh, especially in this case. Uh, we're also doubling down our IBC expansion in China. We've uh, decided to add a second line there, focusing on more clean room type uh, applications and focusing on segments within pharma and specialty chemicals. Um, Luca talked about the 360 drum. So that's something we're doing also in Asia and also focusing on uh, selling small steel drum targeted at uh, 
uh, hazardous goods uh, with, which require UN certification and capabilities. Uh, and on the filling side, um, this is a big opportunity for us uh, as, uh, as we follow our customers and their uh, business growth and, and business requirements in Asia. Uh, we are following them into um, providing filling services for their, for their products uh, in our Shanghai operation and also supporting them in developing their business uh, by focusing on their sampling requirements, which is smaller volumes that were difficult to do, uh, but we're supporting them on that. So that's kind of an overview, a nutshell of uh, what's happening in APAC. Uh, with that, I'll hand over uh, to Roy McAdoo. Thank you, Harry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on the call. Um, I know there's a lot of interest uh, in terms of uh, the supply chain and, and the demand levels and what, what's going to happen next. But just to give you an, a flavor of, of, of how we see the, the, the market update and the market demand levels, we, we've been carrying out this, this question with, with customers over the last number of months, really since COVID began, to try and get a feel for what the demand levels are like across some of the different markets that we service. This particular one you see in front of you here is based on uh, feedback from 200 customers uh, across our, our global customer network. And what it, what it clearly shows is that um, one of the things we've really seen is that demand is back to where it was at pre-COVID levels and, and higher than that in, in some markets. Uh, that overall, the global picture is, is moved very much more to the left. So customers, I mean, the question that is asked is, do you see an increase in, in business in your market in the next 30 days? And the green bar there on the global uh, block shows clearly that there's much more confidence in terms of the market and where it's going, with 40% of the participants saying they expect an increase uh, in, in their business in the next 30 days. That isn't the case across all sectors. As you can see in the petrol and lubricants sector, it's more balanced in terms of negative and, and positive viewpoints. I think that depends on the region you're in and also how close you're linked to, to such sectors as, uh, as maybe aviation and some of the other uh, travel sectors, but the fact that there's still uh, enough customers indicating an increase in demand shows there is also some, some positive views there as well. But when you look at speciality chemicals and food, it skews very much towards a more positive outlook in demand. And, and we have seen that uh, in all the regions. And, and, and what that means is that to a certain extent, it wasn't anticipated by a lot of, uh, the, a lot of the market. The demand has, has come on very quickly from what was quite a sluggish demand if we'd gone back even six to nine months ago. Uh, and that's created huge pressure on, on raw material supply. Um, and that leads me nicely into, into what I think a lot of people are interested in is what happens next in terms of, of raw materials and supply. We picked the six major areas uh, to group together and each of them are, 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 are very strong in terms of demand, but slightly different scenarios. We look at steel, which is where a lot of the pain has been for, for, for us and, and for our customers over the last three to five months. Uh, the issue with steel, it, from a global viewpoint, is, is likely to contain, continue to be a problem, particularly in the EMEA and, and, and Americas regions. Uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of supply, there, there's just not enough supply against the demand that's required. And this has been reflected. The arrows show uh, what, what the increase in, in, in prices have been versus the, the various raw mat material indices. So for steel, it's been up to 70% increase over the last nine, nine months. Uh, and, and, that is, and that is continuing in certain regions. Uh, certain, certain quantities and certain qualities of, of steel are not available, or if they are available in, in limited uh, quantities. Uh, and and uh, when I've finished now, each of the regions, both Gaylord, Paddy and Harry, will give an, an update on, on what's, what is specific to their regions. So, so steel will continue to be an issue um, and, and it will vary depending on the region, but it will continue to be an issue with prices going up further. Resin is a developing issue. Uh, uh, during quarter one, uh, the, the supply of resin was relatively stable and it was meeting the demand. That is changing now in, in quarter two, uh, in March and in quarter two. Some of it is linked to the, the, the seasonal demand levels that we see normally in resin for things like IPCs, uh, for on flexible products, on jerry cans, on plastic drums, linked to the, the agro season and the food seasons. But, but resin is going to be a real challenge, both for polyethylene, polypropylene and polycarbonate over the next few months. Um, the prices are going up significantly, but it's more the, the lack of, of imports into the different regions due to a combination of high demand not enough capacity on stream and the, and the ice storms that we had in North America only a few weeks ago, which severely 
disrupted um, shipments out of that. In terms of paints, closures, and other components, they're also under significant pressure. Paints, as, as some people on this call will know that uh, there's a real struggle to get raw materials in order to produce the paints. So we've seen that come through over the last few weeks. Closures are linked to steel uh, and plastics in many cases. So obviously prices are, are impacted directly by that, but also there are, there are some availability issues in terms of materials coming out of the East, which have been linked to, to shipment problems in terms of the availability of transport. Liner board demand is strong, but in terms of supply, it's more balanced. It, it has been less of an issue up until now in terms of the availability of liner board, but Gaylord will give some more details on that. In terms of transportation, this is more a local and, and regional issues. If, if you've been in the UK or exporting from the UK or importing, uh, you'll have come across the Brexit issues in terms of the customs clearance and, and the documentation and the delays. Availability of drivers is becoming an issue as well, uh, as, as a number of fleets have been reduced in terms of the trailers and the availability of drivers is, is not enough to, to go around for the demand levels. And finally on pallets, timber ballots are, are a real issue, particularly in EMEA. Uh, the availability of timber is very limited. A lot of it's been exported to North America. Uh, you can see that on the HPE index, which is the timber index, which has gone up significantly over the last few months. Uh, and that will continue to develop further the pallets. And pallets like resin and steel, uh, it'll be the availability of timber for pallets will, be, will become a real driving factor in, in, in the coming months. And the management, I mean, overall, the management of all these raw materials has been a real challenge for everyone within Greif. I know it's been a challenge for our customer base as well. Uh, we will continue to manage it as, as, as well as we can. Communication is key. So going back to the previous demand slide, I would ask that any information you can give us and where you see the demand levels for your different markets uh, across the different regions that can be fed back uh, to us will help us to, to uh, minimize the impact on you while at the same time uh, managing the supply of these raw materials. And I'll pass over now to Gaylord to give the, the, the overview for North America. Yeah, no, thanks, Roy. Roy hit most of the high points. Just to kind of give just a brief overview for the Americas and specifically North America. If I look at steel, uh, the steel obviously continues to be very tight in North America. It is better than what it was, you know, two, three months ago in terms of overall supply. Uh, so we are seeing a lot more steel flowing into our facilities. We still are seeing uh, sporadic uh, stockouts of specific sizes. You know, some of the most popular sizes, you know, 1.0, 0.9 millimeter, a 1.4 millimeter steel for covers. Uh, but, but for steel drums, we are seeing a little bit better situation than what we were a couple of months ago, but still gonna remain very tight. Some of the steel shortages have switched in terms of the galvanized side for IBCs. So for tubes, uh, center bridges and that going into IBCs, we are seeing an extremely tight uh, market. That both of those are gonna continue for the next couple of months. So as Roy talked about specifically on steel, I'd say any forecast, any increase in demand that you have, we would love uh, to make sure we get our hands on that, even if we know that it may not be completely accurate, that'll help us continue to plan and bring in raw materials. If I flip over to resin, uh, as, as Roy mentioned, uh, you look at the, the ice storms in the Gulf Coast, there's a lot of resin suppliers that have force majeures out there. Resin is, is extremely tight as well, and it's gonna to continue to be so. I will tell you from our perspective, we are getting our steady flow of resin coming in. Uh, we, we do not have any major concerns right now. We're gonna have some potential slight delays, but everything that we're seeing at this point is North America will continue to get our contracted value, uh, volume levels. We'll be able to drive forward uh, across the, the US. So resin will remain tight, but we do have a steady supply coming in. North, on liner board, really it's, it's tight, but no major concerns of us getting raw, raw materials on liner board for fiber drums, uh, nothing major on that front. I will say one of the challenges that we're having on the transportation side is not on the outbound. We have a lot of you know, semi-dedicated carriers and dedicated carriers to our, our locations that deliver our product to you, our customers. Where we are seeing some extreme tightness is on the inbound raw material side. So even at times when steel and or resin is available, we are struggling to get inbound freight and inbound, inbound transportation to deliver the raw materials. That's one of the, the hottest things we've got going right now. So with the tightness of the steel, with the tightness of the resin, being able to, even if it's ready, uh, we are struggling a little bit to bring that in. Our transportation department is working feverishly to make sure we get any additional carriers 
bringing that material in. So that, that's kind of the high level overview for uh, North America and I'll turn it over to Patty to talk about EMEA. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief um, uh, and, and uh, restricted to the uh, two main areas of steel and resin. On, on steel, yes, we've had a difficult period. We are working closely with our supplier base and, and, and being effective in doing that. Uh, we do see the volatility continuing through to year end. Uh, both in terms of supply and and pricing, but we have not uh, we have not had uh, um, uh, many cases we have uh, of of plant stoppages. There's been the odd case of some hours, but wherever possible, we have we have kept running. But we've had to really move a lot of material around the network in order to make that make that possible. Uh, on resin, the situation is extremely volatile. Um, we're managing it day to day, as we are with steel, but resin is certainly the more challenging at the moment. Um, it's very difficult to get material. We're not getting as much as we need. And when and what we do get, uh, we, uh, we're getting it at inflated prices. So um, again, working very closely with the, with the supplier base and doing everything we can to make sure that we minimize the disruption and keep our customer base supplied. Uh, Roy has covered the other points. I'm not going to repeat them. Um, so we're in for a turbulent time for the for the coming com coming months and resin we see definitely continuing uh, that volatility through the next uh, quarter and then we'll reassess again. I'll hand to Harry for an update on uh, APAC and FBS. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Betty. Real quick here. So I'll start with the flexible business. That's a global business. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing uh, volatility in terms of resin supply, uh, a lot of force majors. What, what I can assure uh, all of our customers is that we do have a plan. We, we have a definite plan to assure supply to you. We, we, are, we are buying um, premium prices over the indices. So that's, that's, that's a challenge that we will continue to have. We believe this will last through um, you know, three to six months. Uh, and the transportation uh, costs, because it's a global business, also adds to this thing. So this is uh, a quick update on uh, the flexible business. Asia is a lot uh, stable. The prices are slightly higher than before, but uh, a lot, lot more stable and a lot more quieter. But we're keeping an eye on that. So with that, I'll pass on to Kim. Thanks, Hari. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Kimberly Kellerman and have responsibilities to really support our internal operations. So our ability to serve our customers and the success of our organization is built upon the people we have within our organization. And we have two key focus areas of how we treat and protect our colleagues. At Greif, we look to foster a culture of inclusion and enable a world-class, diverse and engaged workforce, really reflective of our global communities to deliver on our strategic priorities through our diversity and inclusion framework. This lead framework for diversity and inclusion is focused on creating an inclusive environment where all of our colleagues are treated with respect, valued for the individual strengths, accepted for whom they are, and really encouraged to contribute. This inclusive environment also enables our approach to safety. We are relentless in our efforts to build a safety culture through colleague engagement. We want every colleague to have a sense of personal responsibility to keep themselves and everyone around them safe. This starts with making safety a core value, working every second of every day on the items around this visual and embedded in our organization through our management commitment and leadership style to be a role model to our colleagues. Both of these enable us to have the right skills and right mindset ultimately ensuring our reliability of supply to our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. So we are at the end of our um, presentation. Um, most of the questions have been answered through the, the, the course of the presentation or via the chat. There is one question for you, Luca, related to PCR. This is the following. Do Grife supply UN approved food grade PCR container? Um, we have uh, uh, 
We are producing PCR drums in uh, North America and in Europe, uh, and uh, some of those are also and already UN approved. And uh, we are also working to expand uh, the UN approval uh, in uh, uh, all the line of products, because in this case, except for IBCs, uh, for jerry cans and drums, uh, this is also possible, and uh, we are working on it. So some already exist, uh, some not, uh, but uh, will come in a few months. For IBCs, this is not possible by the law. So UN. Uh, approved IBC to produce with PCR are not possible. So we are producing PCR IBCs, but for non-UN application. For the moment, non-food is uh, uh, not yet available because uh, the PCR that we are using today is uh, coming from uh, uh, industrial used uh, packaging. And that those are not so for suitable for food application, but we are working together with the uh, um, supplier of, uh, of uh, uh, raisins uh, in uh, a new formula of having recycled polyethylene suitable for food, but that this uh, will be available uh, most probably in the last quarter of uh, 2021 or uh, first quarter 2022. Okay, thank you, Luca. Uh, Cheryl, I will let you close by answering a question. Uh, can we get a copy of the presentation and then I let you close the... Yes, absolutely. Um, the recording will be sent out to you later today and your account managers will have copies of the presentations if you're interested. I've launched a poll there. If you're interested in a virtual tour of one of our facilities, please let us know. And if you would like a GRIFE representative to contact you, uh, we can discuss those with you afterwards. Um, but right now we wanna welcome, we wanna welcome, we wanna thank you for attending today's event. We wanna encourage you to watch our social media links and your email. Our next webinar will be at the end of April. We'll focus on recycling and reconditioning in conjunction with Earth Day and everything sustainability in the month of April. So again, thank you very much and thank you for attending. Have a wonderful day.